Welcome. In this video, we'll be discussing the low frequency response of amplifiers, and particularly finding the low frequency cutoff for these amplifiers. Let's get started. So here we've drawn a frequency response for a typical amplifier here. So this is the gain of our amplifier versus frequency potentially in the log domain. And what we have here is we have that the uh, amplifier has a mid-band gain in this region, where this is the uh, where we'll be using the amplifier uh, generally. But at higher frequencies, our amplifier will be rolling off. So it rolls off in this region at high frequencies. We won't be discussing this region in this video. Instead, we'll be discussing the region over to the left, this region here, which is the low frequency region and in particular we'll be trying to find the cutoff here so the re the location where we um, we switch from the gain rising to the midband region so what we'll be, we're looking for then is our low frequency response so we're trying to find the cutoff omega l which is our 3 dB frequency where it changes from going in midband and starts to roll off at low frequencies and we'll find that the highest of the low frequency poles, so there may be more than one pole, but all these low frequency poles, the highest one generally determines this omega L here. And that's where our low frequency is rolling off. So our low frequency region is generally determined by our coupling capacitors and our bypass capacitors. And we'll see an example of each of these in the, uh, in the example. The high frequency region, which we're not discussing in this video, is due to capacitors typically inside the transistors that restrict our high frequency performance. And sometimes there'll be added capacitors that also might limit our frequency response, generally for noise or for stability reasons. As I mentioned, we're focusing on the low frequency in this video. So here's an example to discuss the low frequency behavior of an amplifier. In this case, we have a common source amplifier because the source is common. We have our, gate, our input at our gate and the output taken at the drain. So it's a common source amplifier. And we actually have three low frequency capacitors, C sub C1, C sub C2, and C sub S. All three of these will create a low frequency, will create low frequency poles. So each one creates a low frequency pole. And we typically treat them all independently, find the low frequency pole to each one, and then we find the highest of those three, and that would be our low frequency cutoff. So as I mentioned, these are all our low frequency caps shown here. So these are all typically added. These would not be parasitic capacitors. These would be added capacitors. Why do we add these capacitors? Well, typically, uh, these two capacitors are coupling capacitors. So D they block DC from going from one side to the other side. So that means our DC bias on this side of the capacitor can be different than the DC bias of this side of the capacitor. So it allows us to make our biasing much easier. Similarly, we also this is also a coupling capacitor, uh, C sub C, C sub C2, and that also then blocks the DC from here to here, so we can have a different bias output than we have from our uh, amplifier. So whatever the DC bias is, at this node does not can be a different DC bias that we have at our output, which is driving the load or um, the next amplification stage. Finally, this one down here is also for DC bias help. <clears throat> what it allows, uh, C sub S, is it allows that the, um, from a DC bias perspective, we can determine the, the bias voltage we want over here so at low frequencies, it's easy to set up the bias conditions. 
but mid, mid bend regions, this becomes a short circuit. And so then at uh, the mid bend region, this really just looks like a, a ground at this node. So it's a way of making it look like ground in mid band region and high frequencies, but low frequencies to easily create the bias conditions that we want. So this is typically called a bypass capacitor here. So as I mentioned, the coupling capacitors are C sub C1 and C sub C2, and the bypass capacitor is C sub S. And so it's to make a, a the node VX here look like a small signal ground at mid-band region. So in this circuit, we have three low frequency poles due to the three capacitors. How do we find those poles? Well, we do what we talked about in the previous video, where we take this capacitor C sub C1 and we find the impedance that this capacitor would see across it. So if I look at this one and I look at the impedance it would see looking this way and that way, if we, attach, we took out that capacitor and replaced it with an ohm meter and we set uh, V sub signal equal to zero, what we would see is R sub sig in series with RG. So we would see here that the pole due to C sub C, C, sub C1 here is omega P1 and it's just one over C sub C1 times the series connect series um, uh, connection of R signal plus RG. We can do something similar now for uh, C sub C2. Look at the impedance we see across it. So we look at the impedance we see looking this way and this way. In this example, we're going to assume that R0 of the transistor goes to infinity, but we will include the R sub B do this um, current source over here. So for, um, again, for C sub C2, the impedance that we'll see across it will be a series connection of R sub D and R sub L. So similar to omega P1, uh, we have the, for C sub C2, the other capacitor, the other coupling capacitor, Omega P2 is 1 divided by C sub C2 times the series connection of RD and RL. So RD plus RL. Now finally, we have C sub C S. Sorry, just C S. So for C S, again, we want to find the impedance uh, that it would see across it. So the impedance we see looking down into ground and up into this node. That would be R sub S looking in this direction into the uh, source of the transistor, but also looking down here, which will be our R sub B <coughs> that we've defined over here. <coughs> so we'll see R sub S in, C in parallel with R sub O B. So the last um, pole due to C S, C sub S, is one divided by C sub S times the parallel combination of RS and ROB. So now let's look at more detail on how this C sub S causes a low frequency pole that uh, will determine the um, places a zero near DC and a low frequency pole that uh, helps us out the mid-band region. So let's draw the small signal model of, sorry, small signal model of this here. So we draw the small signal model of that, we have this circuit shown here. So we have R sub D in parallel with R sub L for the uh, drain resistor. We have C sub S as we saw, and R O B is representing the output impedance of the current source, I sub B. We'd like to find the gain from the gate to the drain output here. So what we see here is that DC, and recall that R sub S is just equal to 1 over G over the transistor. 
So what we see is that for DC, the gain of this circuit is going to be the um, short circuit output current at V out, which is going to be 1 divided by RS plus ROB, multiplied by the impedance seen at this output node, at, again at, at uh, V out, and that will equal RD in parallel with RL. And then there's a negative sign because this is inverting amplifier. So the low frequency gain is given by this equation here. The high frequency gain, so as omega gets higher at low frequencies, uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but at low frequencies, this, this looks like an open circuit. So we leave that open when we found the low frequency gain uh, near DC. So at high frequencies, we have um, a very similar analysis, except in this case, C sub S becomes a short circuit because we're at high enough frequencies that C sub S will look like a very low impedance. So we can effectively ignore our OB here. We get almost the same equation, except our OB is now set equal to zero. So we get minus RD in parallel with RL divided by RS. So this is our DC gain, and this is our high frequency gain. Now notice in the case that our OB went to infinity. So if we had an ideal current source here, then in that case, this gain uh, here would go to zero because ROB would be going to infinity. So our DC gain would go to zero and we would have a zero um, at zero frequency. Now, if we plot this um, curve, what we know is that we'll have a low frequency gain, which will be K sub D C in dB, a high frequency gain, which will be given by this, which is K sub infinity in dB, and must go between these two. So we'll get a curve that will look something like that. So now we know that for the pole, we've already found that value. For the pole, omega P3, we found that it has a value given by 1 divided by CS times the parallel combination of RS and ROB. But we also have this zero that occurs, omega Z3. So it turns out that that zero is given by a per, the um, CS multiplied by ROB. So one over CS times ROB, which will always be less than omega P3 since RS in parallel with ROB will always be less than ROB. So that guarantees that the zero will be at a lower frequency than the pole. Now that zero occurs because of the parallel combination of CS and ROB. So when the magnitude um, of the impedance of CS is equal to ROB, that's where our zero will occur. So in other words, in this case here, omega Z3 occurs where the magnitude of 1 over J omega CS is equal to ROB. If you solve for this, you'll find that you get R omega Z3 do that parallel combination. You can also do full analysis and determine this as well. So now given that we've determined omega P1, omega P2, and omega P3, we want to estimate omega L. So we want to find out what is omega L. So omega L is often estimated to be the highest omega P sub i. So this makes the assumption that the highest is maybe five to 10 times higher than the others. Otherwise, this would be a poor approximation. For example, let's say that we had the case where omega P1 was less than omega P3, which was less than omega P2. So that's the order of the um, poles, the low frequency poles. So we plotted the low frequency region for these three poles, we'd find the mid-band region would have some high frequency, or mid-band region gain. It would start to drop off due to omega P2, which is the highest of these three. It would be dropping off going to the left at minus 20 dB per decade, but going to the right at plus 20 dB per decade, it would be rising. 
Then we'd run into omega P3 because it's, a, it's below omega P2, but higher than omega P1. And then it would start to um, drop off at minus 40 dB, minus 40 dB per decade in this direction, going towards uh, zero, or in the other direction here, um, going to the right, going from low frequency to high frequency of plus 40 dB per decade. And similarly, we'd have then finally omega P1 at the lowest of the frequencies. So we would see that this curve here would be plus 60 dB per decade. Then a pull would occur due to omega P1. It would then be rising at plus 40 dB per decade. Then a pull occurs due to omega P3. would then be rising at plus 20 dB per decade. And then a pull occurs due to omega P2. And now we reach our mid-band and it's going at 0 dB per decade. So we'd approximate our omega L be approximately omega p2 in this case, assuming omega p2 is much higher than omega p3. So let's do an example. So in this case, we have the same circuit we had before, and we'll let our uh, signal impedance equal 100 kilo ohms. The gate impedance here equal to 4.7 mega ohms. Since there's no current flowing to the gate, we can make that a fairly high impedance. The drain resistance here will be R sub G is equal to 15 kilo ohms, and R sub L will also be 15 kilo ohms. We're um, going to assume that the GM of the transistor is equal to 1 milliamp per volt, which results in RS being 1 over GM, which is 1 kilo. Ohm. In this example, we'll also assume that ROB, so the output impedance across this current source, is equal to infinity. So it goes to infinity. And our goal is to find the values for C sub, uh, C sub C2, C sub C, C sub C1, and C sub S. So we want to select these values such that our low frequency cutoff is at around 100 hertz. So below that we'll be dropping in a ten, in a gain, so the attenuation will be lowering. And we want to also minimize our total capacitance. So we don't want the capacitances to become too large, so we're going to try to minimize the capacitances here. So our solution, just to rewrite the equations that we have, omega P1 is given by this equation, omega P2 is given by this equation, and omega P3 is given by this equation. Now we notice that in this case, we have that Rs is 1 kilo, which is much less than Rd plus um, RL. So if we look at our equations here, we see that all of these capacitors have RS, RD plus RL, and our signal plus RG. So we notice that RS is, is less than RD plus RL, and that's less than our signal plus RG. So if we want to minimize the capacitance, then with our, um, the fact that this would be at the highest frequency, we want that to be be associated with omega p3 with the lowest impedance. So our capacitance can be small for that one. Smaller, anyway. So um, so we choose omega p3 to be 2 pi times 100 hertz, or equal to our um, 2 pi times FL up here. If we do that, we go through the math here, you see that omega p3 is given by 1 over C sub S times RS, which means CS is just 1 over omega P3 times RS, and so that turns out to be a 1.6 microfarad capacitor. Now we still need to choose C sub C1 and C sub C2. Now here we have some freedom. We need to choose where should omega P1 and omega P2 should be. Should, where should we place those? We must place them less than omega P3, and how much less? Well, perhaps 10. There's two of them here, so 5 maybe is not enough. So we'll make them equal to omega p3 divided by 10. So 10 times lower, since the we'll place the two on top of each other to try to minimize capacitance. So this is a design choice and has some freedom to it. So in this case, we're making omega p1 and omega p2 equal to 2 pi times 10 hertz rather than 2 pi times 100 hertz. So if we do that, we go through the math we'll find that C sub C1 works out to be 3.3 nanofarads, and C sub C2 works out to be 0 0.53 microfarads. And that's, uh, we see that 
C sub C1 is much smaller than C sub C2 because this is such a large resistance and this one is, um, I guess, about 30 kiloohms compared to this one, which is dominating about 4.7 megaohms, which makes the, uh, C, the uh, C sub C1 the smallest of the uh, three capacitors. This is the next largest and the largest is shown here. That ends this video. Thanks for watching.